So, uh, my name is Mike Powell. I'm president of the Brunswick Civil War Roundtable. Ryan Gordon of the Parks and Recreations has asked me to do a couple of short videos on some of the local history of the Cape Fear region while we're all stuck indoors and we can't get out to the historic sites or to our regular history meetings. Uh, we hope that uh, this will help you pass the time. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the United States Life Saving Service. These are America's forgotten heroes. They are the precursor of the U.S. Coast Guard and the two stations at the Cape Fear, one on Bald Head Island, then called Smith Island, and one in on uh, Oak Island, uh, were very, very active in North Carolina shipwreck history and had a, a uh, an honorable uh, service record. So we're going to talk about them today for a little bit. Let me bring up my PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. The motto for the United States Life Saving Service, service that existed officially between 1871 and 1915 motto the book says you have to go out it does not say you have to come back that's a fairly harsh outlook on the job but it is accurate it spoke to the determination of the service their responsibility and the commitment that they that they uh, that they made it spoke to the dangers of the jobs and the possibilities that you may not come back from a rescue even the training was dangerous work I often compare the United States Life Saving Service to fire departments. They exhibit a lot of the same characteristics. It was the same sort of life and probably attracted the same types of men. It all began though in 1786 with what was called the Massachusetts Humane Society, a group of Boston citizens concerned over the deaths of shipwrecks and drownings off of the Massachusetts coast based a system on the Royal Humane Society from Britain. And the Massachusetts organization still exists today, but they provided refugee houses, unmanned huts, a little more than a shelter for survivors, maybe had some water, a blanket, and a flare to, to, to signal for help. But the next 100 years in the history of the service has been described as slow reactionary legislative process. It was a struggle for permanency. Everyone agreed that something had to be done to mitigate the losses of the shipwrecks, but were slow to react. From 1847 to 1871 is when the struggle for permanency takes on its, it, its biggest role. They were beginning to spend a little bit of money, but the money that they spent was on equipment and not very good equipment. They did not spend money on organization or coordination. Whatever equipment they bought was not maintained. It was usually left on the beach to either rot or to be stolen. The Civil War in 1861 ended progress and many of the surfmen were either in the Army or the Navy in the North or South. But shipwrecks continued and it only emphasized the need for a more permanent situation. Finally, in 1878, a breakthrough occurred. And that breakthrough came in the, in the person of Sumner Kimball. He was born and raised in Maine, went to Bowdoin College in Maine, passed the bar in Maine, served in the Maine legislature just prior to the Civil War and in the Treasury Department during the war, served as, as a superintendent for the Revenue Cutter Service in 1871 until 1878, when he was finally appointed to the United States Life Saving Service. Kimball organized the service into 13 districts. Seven of those districts are on the Atlantic coast, North Carolina being part of the six districts. Kimball was a reformer. He established a school for instruction for officers, which was the precursor for the United States Coast Guard Academy. He was very big in drills, constantly drilling, constantly drilling. Instituted a detailed reporting system, the rec reports and the annual reports, and you can get copies of them from their office in Atlanta, Georgia. 
He got rid of all the incompetent political appointees that were wasting the money and, and not doing the job and instituted a merit system for promotions, another move towards permanency. He began using good first class equipment, not the junk that they were buying before. It was well maintained, well inventoried, and they trained on it all the time. There were several shipwrecks that really brought attention to the need in North Carolina for life-saving service stations on our coast. Two of those shipwrecks on Friday the 13th, April 1887, occurred and had a direct influence on Smithville. You can see the names of the crew members there, all names that were well known in Smithville area, and it was a family affair. Two of these gentlemen were sons-in-laws of Charles Dosher, who was the owner. So it was a very dramatic event for Southport to have this happen uh, to them. Other wrecks, such as the loss of the Huron in 1787. She ran aground on a trip from New York to Key West two miles from the station off of Mag's Head in the Outer Banks. However, the season was over and the station was not manned. They only manned the station for certain months out of the season back then. And 85 of the 115 crewmen perished. This loss did lead to a longer season for the stations to be manned. There we go. The next shipwreck was the Metropolis in January of 1787. It caused a lot of publicity and moved the idea forward for permanent life-saving stations off the coast of North Carolina. She came ashore in heavy weather near Curatuck Light. She was loaded with 500 tons of machinery and iron and headed for Brazil with 215 passengers. During a storm, the pumps failed, the cargo shifted, leaving her dead in the water, subject to the heavy seas. Station crews were very late in getting to the scene and ill-equipped to perform their duties. The cart carrying their equipment had to be pushed through the sand and it took four hours. It, it took hours for them to travel four miles, pushing the cart through the sand. They were not able to successfully get ropes to the ship and the disaster was complete. Both of these shipwrecks, the Huron and the Metropolis off the coast of North Carolina brought a lot of attention to the need. The poor performances of these volunteers at these two disasters were criticized in Washington. There was a lot of talk about placing them under the United States Navy or discipline and organization, but instead they placed their faith in Sumner Kimball. With the Outer Banks as the graveyard of the Atlantic, its many wrecks earned it the first building program for stations in North Carolina. Where were the, a lot of these stations? Of course, they were going to be around the lighthouses, located in the same places as the lighthouses, and for the same reasons. These were the dangerous waters that drew the most shipwrecks. The, the buildings that were built as the stations all had a very similar look. There were basically three types of life-saving stations that were approved. Uh, there was the lifeboat station. It had only a keeper and a boat. There was the house of refuge, which was merely shelter only, blankets and flares, much like the unmanned huts of the Massachusetts uh, Society. And then, of course, there was the main stations with, with the crews. If the station's design was all about utility. Typically, they were small. 42 by 20 foot rooms. The early 1874 designs that were done in the upper outer banks were strictly utilitarian, a rough Spartan existence. 
very similar to the volunteer uh, fire uh, houses. No frills, no frills, everything has a purpose. We see here from the floor plans that the upper floor was for the crew quarters. The lower floors were for the boat room, the kitchen, keeper's room, pantry, and where they would store a lot of their equipment. There would come a time later on in the evolution of these buildings being designed that boat houses would be built separately from them. This is the picture of the Cape Fear Station, the one that was on Smith Island and now Bald Head Island. This station went online in uh, 1883 with Smithville resident Dunbar Davis as keeper. John Watts would replace Davis in 1891 when he was appointed to the Oak Island Station, when, when, when Dunbar Davis was appointed to the Oak Island Station, and we will hear a lot about him in, a, in, in just a little while. Watts would remain keeper on the Cape Fear Station until 1911 and would be replaced by Sam Brinkman, Dunbar Davis's son-in-law. And he would remain until 1915 when the U.S. Coast Guard took over. The station was a basic design and it had a separate boathouse, as we can see. The station was located on the East Beach, about a mile above Old Inlet, and it was lost to erosion in 1914. The Oak Island Station was built in 1889. Like the Cape Fair Station, it was designed by Jay Parkinson, who was Assistant Superintendent of Construction for the United States Life Saving Service. And it went online in 1889 with Thomas Savage as the keeper. He was replaced by Dunbar Davis in 1891. And Davis remained keeper until 1915 when the US Coast Guard took over. The station was built on the grounds of the Cape Fear Military Reserve, a little over a mile from the gate of the North Carolina Baptist Assembly in Fort Caswell today. This is where the lighthouse and the U.S. Coast Guard Station now stand. In 1937, the house was sold and to a private owner and moved across the street, just east of the parking lot for the uh, lighthouse uh, patrons. The design featured gabled ends, truss work, and most had lookout towers. The design, still very Spartan, still very utilitarian, but this was much more livable than some of the designs of the early 1870s. Both the station on Oak Island and on, the, on Cape Fear had boat houses. They were small, plain buildings used to store the boats, maintain, uh, the equipment, and as the stations become, they evolved, uh, they became separate buildings on, on their own as at Oak Island. At Oak Island, it was attached, but later designs had separate buildings. At Cape Fear, it was, it was separated. So what was station-like life? Here we see the inside of the station. They usually had a nine-man crew with a keeper who was the captain. It was not for the weak. Experience on the water was preferred, but not mandatory. The life of the crewman was dominated by drill, patrol, equipment maintenance, and the occasional rescue. It was dangerous work. The pay was low. The government provided no insurance, no pension. It took a committed man to serve. They served 24-hour watches in four-hour shifts, two men to a shift one while walking in each direction on the beach as patrol with a man in the tower, always looking out for problems. The warrant officer was the keeper. The keeper worked the tiller on the surf boat and was the only one facing ahead as the others rowed out to whatever shipwreck they were going to. The keeper was there year round, but the crew was laid off from April to November when shipwreck numbers decreased. If a wreck occurred during that time, the keeper would grab whoever was available, civilians, citizens, anyone was called into action at that time. There was generally a boatsman mate and later on when they began using motors 
on the surf boats, they had a motor machinist made. The surfmen were ranked by number. The number one surfman was sort of a second in command to the keeper. The 24 hour day was set up to have a very specific schedule. You could read in the newspapers that was published a schedule in the newspaper. It all was around the various drills, maintenance of the equipment, practicing resuscitation and first aid procedures, taking the boats out, uh, launching the boats, capsize drills, these sorts of things. All very dangerous stuff. The only day they were off was Sunday. Their day began at 7 a.m. and went till 4 p.m. at least. Maintenance of the station was also a priority on the Saturday, on Saturday uh, uh, of the weekend. Their uniforms in 1889 were, it were first issued. It was a standard uniform. It featured a blue woolen double-breasted coat with two rows of buttons. The men had to pay for their own uniform. North Carolina Maritime Museum in Southport has part of a uniform and some of the insignia that you see here on display. So you want to go check that out. They have a great exhibit there right now. Their work clothes consisted of a hat with a 360 degree brim to cover the wind and rain from every direction. Their overalls were of brown rubber cloth or duck cotton and with the station name printed across the chest. Hip boots and a court life vest completed the storm gear. The main function for this for the life saving service was being on patrol. The way is long, dreary, obscure, lonesome, sinister, difficult, and perilous. The fitful lights and shadows of lantern alone marked the somber way. A lantern and flares was pretty much all they carried. They usually walked each one in each direction, one man in each direction for between two and a half to three miles. This was the mainstay of the service, the patrols. The way they signals was for flares. There were no telephones in Venom until 1895. But flares always meant trouble, either signaling a, sh a ship that it was coming too close to shore or signaling back to the station that there was a wreck already on shore. But the training and the drills were all for the main event. And we'll begin the main event, which is the rescues at the boathouse. We see here what, what they generally look like, uh, storage of equipment, like a garage, except with, with cars, boats hanging, and, uh, and ready for their use. They used special equipment. The cart that carried the, all this equipment to the beach was called the beach apparatus. It was a two-wheeled cart, and they carried specialized equipment, ropes, shovels, flares, what was called a Lyle gun that we'll discuss, tackle, anything that they could possibly use in the rescue. The boats, there were several different designs, but not much difference until the motor boats came along later on. They were generally 25 to 27 feet in length, six to 10 oars. Sail rig was optional. Main idea here though was how do you get it to the beach? How do you get it from the boathouse to the beach? The lucky ones had horsepower. If you didn't, then you see as in the bottom photo, you had to drag that sucker through the sand, and that was not easily done. Hopefully you had a source. Once you got the boat to the beach, you had to launch the boat. Some, some places had ramps, some did not. Once the boats uh, were, uh, were in the water, uh, it was generally in a storm. That's what caused the shipwreck. So it was tough work getting out past the breakers. Stay in the boat. That's the main thing. We got to get a rope to the sh to the ship in distress. But as I said before, generally they were doing this in heavy seas, 
and it was not uncommon for men to be thrown overside, uh, overboard. That's why the court life vest. Dangerous, dangerous work. Stay in a boat, the main thing. They would use the boats if the wreck was over 500 yards from shore. Uh, they had no way to get a line, a rope to the boat. And that was the whole idea, was to get a rope to the boat. Uh, beyond 500 yards, they had to actually sail out to it. If it was inside of 500 yards, they could use what was known as the Lyle gun. Developed by an Army Captain, David Lyle, in 1877. It was a bronze, smooth bore, short barreled cannon. It was portable, so it was carried on the beach apparatus. It was inexpensive, it was user friendly, and it was a way to get the rope to the wreck. It shot a line that could, that, and once that line was attached to the highest point on the wreck, they could begin to deploy what was known as the breeches buoy. And the breeches buoy was a, a pulley system that allowed one person at a time to be attached to a sort of seat and pulled to shore. It was a slow process, and depending on how many men were on the ship being rescued, could take quite some time, and they were in a race to get them off before the ship went under the waves. For those that could not stay in the boat, and if the weather was simply too rough, there was the life car. Not every station had these. They were, these were self-contained, uh, capsules uh, used in the worst of weather or if they had to get some injured from the boat to shore. But let's talk about the Cape Fear stations on Bald Head Island, Smith Island back then, and Oak Island uh, uh, today. The Wilmington Messenger of October 1894 wrote the Cape Fear and Oak Island crews lead all others in the number of seamen rescued from watery graves. They were doing a great job. There were 130 rescued from the Cape Fear Station in 11 years and 56 rescues from the Oak Island Station in only four years. The hero for the Oak Island Station is Dunbar Davis. He uh, was born in 1843, served in Galloway's Coast Guard Company in the Civil War, also ser served at Fort Fisher, keeper of the Cape Fear Station from 1883 to 1891, and then transferred to the Oak Island Station in 1891 to 1915. He ended his career in 1915 when the U.S. Coast Guard took over. Their regulations forced him into retirement because of his age. But the big day for Dunbar Davis and the two stations uh, on, on the Cape Fear was August 28th through August 31, 1893, the Sea Island Hurricane. The deeds on, the, on these days were 48 continuous hours of service in which they made five rescues off the, off the coast. It was a tremendous storm. Uh, Susie Carson, famous historian for uh, Southport, wrote an article that it was the worst storm in, this, in, in the state's history up, up to that time. It followed the same course as Hurricane Hugo up the coast and wreaked havoc. But in 48 hours, as you can see, the, the red stars indicate the ships that were saved. The blue stars are the ones for the station. It was actually a song by a group called Scars and Kettner called The Long Day of Dunbar Davis. The Oak Island Cruise, there was a Southport's Who's Who. The map here with the red blocks shows where these gentlemen lived. They were very, very much part of a community very much part of the community. The station continued to serve well until 1915, at which time the Revenue Cutter Service was combined with the United States Life Saving Service to create the Coast Guard. Their regulations and the station itself is still active today on Oak Island. 
So I hope this gives you a little bit of insight into uh, America's forgotten heroes, the United States Life Saving Service. These guys uh, for very low pay, very little compensation, uh, had a very strong commitment to their, to their service and to the job that they did on the coast. Thanks very much and I hope you enjoyed this.